Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for your presence here. We just ask you to send your Holy Spirit now. We pray that you would use Pastor Izzy to encourage us. Give us this day our daily bread and encourage us in your word this morning. Oh, excellent. Uh, Lord, as we, as we studied patience last week, Lord, we pray that you continue to strengthen those fruits that we've talked about already as we learn about new, new, new fruits that we can add to, those, uh, add to mm-hmm. that list that we can apply to our life. Now, ask, Lord, that you keep the distractions away. Lord, help us to trust you and keep our eyes fixed on you. We ask that now in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, guys. We're going to be in Galatians 5 again as we continue looking at the fruits of the Holy Spirit that Paul has written to the church at Galatia to tell them about. Now, we're doing an in-depth study of each fruit. So bear with those of you that know, some of you know this by heart, wrote, you know, the fruits of the Spirit found in verse 22. The fruits of the Spirit is first what? Love, joy, peace, patience. And today we're going to come to the next one, kindness and goodness. We're going to try to squeeze two together. They're actually very complementary, aren't they? Kindness and goodness go together. But they're not the same thing. Kindness and goodness are have a subtle difference. You know, I, I, I think you can do goodness and not be kind. I, I, have you ever run into that where someone does you a good deed, but they're not very kind about it? You almost feel like, I wish you wouldn't have done me a good deed because you made me feel like dirt. You know, here, I'm going to help you out this time. You know, oh, thanks. You know, <laughs> rather you just didn't help. I mean, sometimes without kind, kindness is really a, a sweet gift. And I like that, the, that Paul puts it first. Uh, before, you know, we have love, peace, patience, right? I'm sorry, peace, joy. Wait, love, joy, peace, patience. Sorry, I had to look at my hand. Love, joy, peace, patience, then kindness, then goodness. And if you put them in that order and add those fruits of the Spirit in your think about yourself. Or if you said, I, uh, I, how well am I weighing out in the fruits of the Spirit? Just put your name in. Like I've done before when we did the, the 1 Corinthians 13 verse, I said, love is patient, love is kind. Just put your name in that spot. Now you all chuckle at my expense when I do this. Izzy is patient, Izzy is kind, Izzy is not jealous. Is he does not right? You just do First Corinthians thirteen there four to eight, and and every time the word love appears, put your name. See how fast or how quickly you spot areas for growth <laughs> in your Christian walk. Well, Paul is going over the fruits of the Spirit, and the list is well, it's very close to the same. But the first one was love, and you get to break that one down in First Corinthians. Then we had joy and peace, and then patience last week. Now, this week, we're going to look at the fruit of kindness. What is kindness? I mean, if you were going to say, is this this an important fruit for a Christian to have? I'd say in America, we have a lot of Christians without this fruit. Sad to say, I even know some non-Christians that are kinder than Christians. That's a very sad commentary. It should never be so, but it is. There are some Christians that they just lack the ability to be kind. But let me show you a proverb. Proverbs chapter 19. If you would just turn with me. I want to show you in the Proverbs. W- w- there is a proverb what is written on life and conduct. This Proverbs, Proverbs 19, tells all of these things about how it is good for a man to be gracious. Verse 17 says, one who is gracious to a poor man, he lends to who? Lord. To the Lord. And if you lend to the Lord, what does it say will happen? Some people ask, why are you guys so big about helping the poor here at your church? I said, oh, you obviously haven't read this proverb. Proverbs 19 tells it right like it is. If you're gracious to a poor man, does the Lord see that? And what does it say here? Let me show you. Verse 17 says, and God will repay him for his good deed. Whenever you are gracious to someone that is in a in a In a worser way than you, God sees that. And God, it says, will be no man's debtor. So when it comes to you, you know, 
doing a good thing in the sight of the Lord, don't think God is ever going to not be able to pay up for what you did. That, in fact, how many of you have seen God's hand where you did something he, he prompted you to do? You helped someone, and you, you didn't, maybe it was on the way home from church, you stopped, you, you helped someone out, and before you could even get to the house, the Lord is already repaying you in, in ways that you didn't even see coming. You know, the Lord is so good at repaying us when we, when we are gracious to those less fortunate. Now, this proverb goes on to say, listen, verse 20, to counsel, accept discipline that you might be wise the rest of your days. Verse 21 says, many are the plans of a man's heart. But the counsel of the Lord, it says, it shall stand. Or another translation says, and the Lord will direct. You can have many plans, but the Lord directs your what? Your steps. He's the one who ordains or sets that path for you to walk in. Now, verse 22, I don't know why they skipped this one. Maybe it was when I was in catechism they forgot this part. But it says here, what is desirable in a man is his what? His kindness. It says, and it is better to be a poor man than to be a liar. This whole proverb talks about how we conduct ourselves in this world. It's better to be a poor man than to be a liar, according to the scripture. But it's desirable, and I like this in the Hebrew, it's a little stronger. It is desirable by who? Who, who desires this? Do you guys know? Because it doesn't come across very good in English. Who's the one who desires that men be kind? Be the yeah, if she said the fellow upstairs. That would be right. It's the Lord. The Lord himself desires for men to be kind. It's a something that he, he wants us to be known as people filled with this fruit of the Spirit, his kindness. Now, if you don't know how to be kind, the Bible says everything that, well, of the heavenly things that we learn, we just have to look to the source. You know, we learn how to love, it says, because God first loved us. We want, we want to learn how to be kind. Well, look at how kind has God been to us. It says his loving kindness is new every what? Every morning. We just sang it this morning. And great is his faithfulness. Look at the Lord, the giver of loving kindness, of mercy. It's another translation. That, that, that mercy is, mercy is getting, well, not what, not what you deserve. Because if you got what you deserve, you'd be in a big world, of, I'd be in a world of hurts. But the Lord in his mercy doesn't give me that. Instead, he gives me grace and, and gives me things I don't deserve. I didn't even merit them. That's what grace is, unmerited favor. Now, lest the girls think this is only for guys, let me show you in Proverbs 31. That you, you, you probably have heard this passage, the excellent wife who can find her worth is far above jewels. And the heart of her husband trusts in her, and in her, in, in her he has no lack of it. Well, that's the beginning of the, uh, of the passage in, in verse 10 of Proverbs 31. But if you go to the end, to verse 26, it says that, well, let me start with verse 25. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she smiles at the future. A godly woman, she has strength and dignity. And it says, and she opens her mouth in wisdom, and the teaching of what is on her tongue? kindness or faith it's interesting the translations the translators when they came to this word they said this is the word what god has towards us that everlasting faith the faithful mercy or kindness is right here the teaching of that is on now it's really good when your mom teaches you to be kind because moms you might not realize it but you have probably the greatest effect on whether your boys are going to be kind boys when they grow up Y y you know, young men probably learn this better from moms than from dads. Hate to say it, but it doesn't say the teaching of kindness is on the dad's tongue. It says it's on the mom's tongue. Because I think that as young boys, we're influenced so much by our mothers. And what the, the things when they teach you to be kind to those people is so important in this generation that we learn this. Now, in the book of um, Samuel... First Samuel, it is in chapter 25. There's a story about a woman who shows kindness. And some of you know this story. Her name's Abigail. 
And she was married to a man named Nabal, which in Hebrew, Nabal means fool. It's not really, I, who would name their kid fool? This is, this is crazy to me. You know, you have a kid, what should we name him? Fool. <laughs> How would you like growing up with that your whole life, you know? What's your name? Fool. Okay, hey, fool. Yo, fool. I mean, that's what Nabal means, literally, in Hebrew. It's fool. But in this story, we're going to find out that this man, and by the way, I think you should be very careful what you name your kids. Because do you think it has any influence on them? Oh, yeah. I mean, your whole life, we're going to see that in this story, Abigail will actually proclaim that fool is his name and basically fool is his game. He, he actually lives up to his name. He, it's just, it's the way he is. He's a fool. And this story has, um, well, just to set the story, it's in the days when King David isn't a king yet. The Lord is calling him and anointing him to be the next king. But Saul isn't really happy about this. And so Saul has his armies out hunting David to uh, kill him. David has about 300 merry men. No, they're not really merry. They're the, they're the discontent and the ones that are that, that, that insurrectionists, the, the guys that are want to overthrow Saul. They're mad at the government. They're mad about... Uh, he has the real motley crew is what he's got. In fact, at one point, he's going to take those guys and lead them in a charge, and, and they're going to go fight a battle. They'll win, but when they come back, the enemy's going to have pillaged the camp, and his own men will go, you're a terrible leader. Let's kill you. <laughs> I mean, from love David to hated David, this guy goes up on all over the scale. But on this particular day... David's men have been very faithful, looking after, um, well, Nabal had his flocks with, he's a very wealthy guy, I forgot to tell you this, fool, but wealthy fool, okay, he's rich. And he had his, his uh, herds and flocks out in the fields, and David's men had been encamped in the hillsides, hiding from Saul. But it says that they actually showed favor to the herdsmen and, and, and the shepherds, uh, of Nabal, and they actually looked after them and kept them safe. They just had pity on them. And, and at this point in, in 1 Samuel 25, we read that they decide they want to have a, a, a little feast, a little festival of just rejoicing, you know. And so they send word to Nabal, hey, look, we've been guarding your guys and your stuff. Nothing's gone missing. And um, we'd like to ask for a couple of sheep and some you know, maybe a few, few uh, bread cakes and stuff and some wine, and we're going to have a, a little, a little f celebration. And um, would you pitch in? You know, it's time to have a little party. And, you know, you basically have benefited because we've looked after you. Otherwise, guys would have pounced on your guys and taken your stuff. And so could you just, you know, out of, uh, a nice, out of, out of what, what we call this, out of kindness, you know, just... um. Send us a little, and it's nothing. This guy is so rich. What they're asking for is a little meal. And does he want to give a meal? Have any of you read this story? Let me, let me just read this to you. First Samuel 25, it says here, uh, it says, Then Samuel died, and Israel altogether mourned for him. They buried him at the house of Ramah, and David arose and went to the wilderness of Paran. Now, Moen, whose, whose business was there, was in Carmel, and, and the man was very rich. And he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, and it came about while he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now, the, the man's name was also called what? Nabal. And, uh, and his wife's name was Abigail. Now, this woman was intelligent, and she was beautiful in appearance, but the man was harsh and evil in his dealings, and he was a Calebite. Remember Caleb, Joshua and Caleb? The, the two guys that actually got to go in 40 years later into the promised land. This man is a descendant from Caleb. You'd think, dude, you have good roots, you know, good stock. You should have come out. Does it m just necessarily hold true just because your, your great-grandpa was a good, godly man that you turn out right? Or your father? I, I, this is one of the things the Scripture bears out. There is no guarantee. You know, it seems like when you study the Scripture in the Old Testament, you have one very righteous king followed by one 
his son, wicked king. Then back to righteous. Then wicked. They, they ping pong back and forth. A couple wicked, a couple righteous. Then a righteous wicked, righteous wicked. You know, you, 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 you study Israel's history. You go, there's no pattern that you can, you, there's no guarantee. I'm so grateful my son serves the Lord. Because I've seen a lot of pastors have the greatest heartaches because their kids turn out to be like, I ain't going that way, Dad. I forget God, and they rebel. Well, Nabal was one of these characters. They didn't stick to Caleb's, uh, you know, example, but instead did evil and harshly in his dealings. Now, David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep. So David said, ten, sent ten young men. David said to the young men, go up to Carmel and visit Nabal and greet him in my name. And thus you shall say, have, have a, a, a long life and peace be with you. That's Hebrew, you know, shalom greeting of peace and and peace be to your house and be to all that you have now i've heard that your shearers um th that you have your shearers and and your shepherds have been with us and we have not insulted them nor have they missed anything all the days that they were in carmel so ask your young men and they will tell you therefore let my young men find favor in your eyes for we've come on a festive day Please give us whatever you find at your hand to your servants and to your son, David. Now, when David's young men came, they spoke to Nabal according to these words in David's name. And they 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 all waited. And, and it says, but Nabal answered David's servants and said, who is David and who is the son of Jesse? And there are many servants today who are breaking away from his master. He's just a rebel. He's breaking away from the house of uh, uh, of his father, Jesse. He says, shall, shall I then take of my bread and my water and my meat and have, uh, 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 that I have slaughtered for my shearers and give it to these men whose origin I don't know? I don't even know where these guys are from. Can you just hear this guy? Wee, wee, wee. So David's young men, they retraced their way back, and they went back and told David according to all the words he had said. And David said to his men, each of you gird his sword. So each man girded it. Now, what's it mean to gird your sword? Put it on. Why do you put on your sword? To fight. So David girded on his sword, and there were about 400 men who went up behind David, while 200 stayed with the baggage. But one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, and he scorned them. And yet the men were very good to us, and, and we were not insulted, nor did they, we miss anything as long as we went about with them while we were in the fields. No, they looked after us. So they reported to Abigail what, what really went down. And they, it says they were a wall to us, both, he says, by night and by day. And, and we were with them tending the sheep. So they, they protected us. It was great having David's men. They were, they were like a, a wall, a guard to us. Now, when you're out shepherding sheep in the field, do you always feel secure? I mean, come on. This is something that David, by the way, was a shepherd boy. When the, the Lord called him as a young man to, to serve him, but he had compassion and he even had his own men, soldiers. Although they'd be, we call the ratty tat, tat group of soldiers, the, bad, the, the real, you know, bad guys, a few defunct Green Berets and, 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 and you know, flunkies, but they, he had the pretty bad fighters in his group. But they were a wall to, 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 to Nabal's shepherds. Now, therefore, when they told this to Abigail, they said, now, therefore, know and consider what you should do, for evil is plotted against our master and against all his household. And he is, <laughs> he is such a worthless man that no one can speak to him. This is his own men telling Abigail, there's, there's evil going to happen to us because of what, what he said. So Abigail, listen to this. This kind woman, this one, she shows you... Watch how much kindness plays a part in this story. She hurries and takes 200 loaves of bread, two jugs of wine, five sheep that were already prepared. Okay, remember, they just did the slaughtering. She took five sheep already prepared, five measures of roasted grain, and 100 clusters of raisins, 200 cakes of figs, and loaded them on donkeys. And she said to her young men, Go on before me. Behold, I am coming after you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal. 
And it came about as she was riding on her donkey and coming down by the hidden part of the mountain that, behold, David and his men were coming down toward her. And so she met them. Now David had said, Surely in vain I guarded all that this man has in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that belonged to him, and he has returned me evil for good. He said, May God do so to the enemies of David, uh, 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 and more also, if by morning I leave as much as one male of any who belong to him. Do you think David's a little ticked? If I leave just one male of his alive by morning... Uh, that's it, man. This this dude. Now, I, I know David's a Jew, but he's got to have a little Sicilian blood in there somewhere. <laughs> because this this sounds like my family upbringing, you know. If I leave one of them alive by my, I, I am so mad. And he's mad. Now, is it? did you ever realize that in the Bible it actually rats on these guys? It tells they get mad. It tells they're going to, he's going to kill them, you know. And so, I, I I like this that this these guys are real. This is a real and this is real mad, okay. Just to get it clear, I don't want you thinking he was just a little bit tweaked about not getting the food. He's ready to wipe out every male that belongs to this guy Nabal. He's ticked, right? I mean, this is you'd call this pretty steamed, right? And yet Abigail. When she saw David, listen to what she did. She hurried and dismounted from her donkey, fell on her face before David, and bowed herself to the ground. And she fell at his feet and said, On me alone, my Lord, be all the blame. Please, she said, let your maidservant speak to you and listen to the words of your maidservant. Please, she said, let my Lord pay attention not to this worthless man, Nabal. For as his name is, huh, well, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. Nabal's his name, and folly is his game. I mean, th she flat out calls her husband. Well, he is. She said, but I, your maidservant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. Now, therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives, as your soul lives, since the Lord has restrained you from shedding blood and from avenging yourself by your own hand, now then, let your enemies and those who seek evil against my Lord be as Nabal. Now let this gift which your maidservant has brought to you, my Lord, be given to the young men who accompany my Lord. Please forgive the transgression of your maidservant, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord an enduring house, because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord. And evil will not be found in you all your days. And should anyone rise up to pursue you and seek your life, then the life of my Lord shall be bound in, in the bundle of the living with the Lord your God. But the lives of your enemies he will sling out as from the hollow of a sling. Man, she's really laying it on, isn't she? God's going to bless you and to abundance and, and, and your enemies, he's going to fling them out like a rock from a, you know the hollow of the sling. And well, David was the dude that took the sling and through the rock that hit Goliath, remember? So she's like, that's what's going to happen to your enemies. Boom, they're going to be gone. And who is she saying to blame all of the, the, the food mistake on? Her. D it's my fault. I didn't get to, I wasn't there. I didn't hear. Please just put all the blame on me. Listen to this. And when the Lord does for my Lord according to the good that he has spoken concerning you, and he appoints you ruler over Israel. Did she know God had appointed that David would be the next king? Yeah. She knew what the prophet had done and anointed him. And she knew that Saul was seeking his life. And she says, thus it will not cause grief or trouble for my Lord, both by having shed blood without cause and by my Lord having avenged himself when the Lord deals with my Lord. Then she said, remember your maidservant. So she's like, look, I know God's going to make you the next king. So please don't, don't do this bad thing because it'll cause grief for you when you're the king. Now her words are really sound. She knew it would become a reproach if David took his own revenge at this point. Later down the road, it'd be like, yeah, you're the guy God appointed king, but you like slaughtered that 
guy and his, that fool and all his household over some food. So she's like, please don't do it. God will take care of it. Listen to Dave. I, lo- I love this. Dave, verse 32, you see the heart of Dave. Then David said to Abigail, now he was hot under the collar about this, but listen to what he says. He says, blessed be the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me. And blessed be your discernment and blessed be you. To Abigail, he blesses her. You have kept me this day from bloodshed and, avenge, and, and from avenging myself by my own hand. Nevertheless, as the Lord God of Israel lives, who has restrained me from harming you, unless you had come quickly to meet me, surely there would not have been left to Nabal until the morning light as much as one male. David's telling her, it's really good you came. As I, I am telling you, by morning, I wasn't going to leave one guy alive in his house. So David received from her hand what she had brought and said to her, go up to your house in peace. See, I've listened to you and granted your request. Now, her kindness just averted all of the males in their house from dying. How powerful is one act of kindness? I mean, think about it. Just... Her one act of kindness just saved every male in that house. Now, if you don't know the, the what comes next of this particular saga, does she turn out to be anything big in God's plan or anything? Any of you guys read ahead in this part? Just, just for, just bear with me. for the ones that are new. You guys are just learning about the Lord. They don't know the rest of the story. This story gets juicy. <laughs> I, I call it juicy because it's really good. Let me show you what happened. Verse 36. Then Abigail, it says, came to Nabal, and behold, he was holding a feast in his house, like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunk. And so she did not tell him anything at all until morning light when he was hungover. No, and I put that in there. That wasn't in the text. If you're really drunk and, well, okay, anyway. But in the morning when, when the wine had gone out of Nabal, His wife told him these things, and what happened? And his heart died within him so that that he became as a stone. And ten days later, the Lord struck Nabal, and he died. In other words, we would say he had a, what, heart attack? She told him the next morning after, you know, after the wine had left him. I like how the Bible puts that. The wine has left him, but, um, you know, He's got probably a pounding headache and suffering from the hangover. And she goes, and oh, by the way, here's what I did. So and, and, and David said he wouldn't kill all the men in our house. And What? I, I, when we get to heaven, i got to ask for the replay. You know, a stroke. Maybe it was a stroke. <laughs> As a stroke. Oh. Ten days later, he's dead. But that's not the part I want to show you. The juicy part comes next. Let me show you. Verse 39. When David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord who has pleaded the cause of my reproach uh, from the hand of Nabal and has kept back his servant from evil. Thank you, Lord, you kept me from doing evil. And you basically, thank you, you took care of the guy. You know, like, (coughs) isn't it nice when the Lord fights your battles? In fact, won't it be David that will write that in the Psalms that the battle belongs to who? To the Lord. He's got a living example of this right here. Where the Lord fights his battle. He's like, blessed be the name of the Lord. Lord, you took care of Nabal for me. So the Lord also returned the evil doing of Nabal on his own head, on Nabal's head. And David sent a proposal to Abigail. A proposal for what? Do you see it right there? To take her as his wife. Lady, you are so kind. You kept me from doing evil. And God, God was strong on my behalf because of your words. Your actions, your kindness. I want to marry you. He sent word and proposed. Did she marry him? Do you guys know? Well, and when the servants of David came to Abigail at Mount Carmel, uh, or at Carmel, they spoke to her, saying, "David has sent us to you to take you as his wife." And she arose and bowed with her face to the ground, and said, "Behold, your maidservant is a maid to wash the feet of my lord's servants." Then Abigail quickly arose, rode on a donkey with her five maidens who attended her, and she followed the messengers of David and became his wife. I think. Don't think your kindness goes overlooked, guys. 
Kindness is a powerful thing. She got to wind up being married to the next king of Israel. But she kept him from sinning. Talk about a good future, you know, setup, you know. Before she's even his wife, before she, she, was, she was faithful to her own husband. She was looking out for her own husband and her own husband's household and showing by just a deed of kindness, gathering the food and putting it on the donkeys. Come on, let's get this to David's men right away. And then I, I, I marvel at this woman's kindness. I mean, she's like, just don't blame him, blame me. But it's my fault. I didn't get to hear they were there. I'm sorry, you know. She, she's like diffusing the situation. She's what she's doing. Kindness does that, by the way. Did it work? David blessed her for stopping him from doing evil that day. And then he winds up, how much does he like her? <laughs> A lot. <laughs> Will you be my wife? I mean, talk. Do, did you see that coming in the story? I mean, those of you that already knew the story, I can't help it. You already knew. I, it wasn't a, I couldn't spoiler alert. You already knew she was going to. Wind up being, but for those of you who just heard the story, did you see that one coming? That he would actually call and ask, "Would you come and be my wife?" What a good woman! You know, kindness is something we need to sport as Christians. In our Christian, in our Christianity, you can talk all the stuff about God, but if you don't have kindness, you don't show it by your actions, by your words. People are going to spot it. Jesus said, "They will know that you're my disciples." In that you have what? Love for one another. By your fruit. People are looking at the fruit of the Spirit in your life. And if you don't see these fruits in your life, you need to go to the Lord and say, Lord, please help me stay with you. Jesus said, if you abide in me and I abide in you, you'll bear much fruit. I'm the vine, you're the branches. The only thing a branch needs to do to bear fruit is stay connected to the vine. And that's Jesus. The only thing as Christians, some Christians are like, okay, I'm going to try to be more kind, Pastor, this week. <laughs> it's going to break kill me. You're right. Because if you try to do it in your own strength, you can't. But if you ask the Lord, Lord, let me become like you. Let me stay with you. Let me hang out with you and, and, and just stay close. You, you know when you're staying close to the Lord. In fact, this is the simplest, basis teaching I've ever been able to share with the kids about abiding. Jesus says, abide in me, I'll abide in you. Abide means stay put, remain, stay, stuck to. When a tree is planted by the rivers, it abides there. It gets the nutrients from that river. It grows healthy and strong. You take the tree, pop it up by the roots and move it away out into the desert. What's going to happen to the tree? going to die we need to stay by that living water the source is jesus he's the one that supplies it to us we have to stay connected to him but if you want to find out if you have any area of your life that perhaps you're sinning in that you want to kind of spiritually bone up your 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 walk with the lord this this year you want to get it in line think about that jesus is there to be with you everywhere you go all the time he's He's right there, isn't he? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art what? With me. Now, I may sound like a broken record to you, but this is so important. The Lord is supposed to be with you all the time. And if, if you have a friend come to town, and we have that all the time here in Hawaii, because everyone wants to come see Hawaii, it's amazing how much company. I didn't have, I couldn't get my own brother, David, to come visit me in Tempe. And he lived in Tempe, just a few blocks away. <laughs> we moved to Hawaii. He was at our house like a month later. <laughs> he stayed a long time, too. I was like, wow. What's with this? I mean, everyone wants, they want to come see you. But when, when people come to see you, and, and really, if, if you're, if you're, transparent with the with the with that person when they come to see you and and you just live your life so that they can hang out with you see how life is here and you know when it's my own brother i can just be like hey this is how it is man there's sleep on the couch or there's a futon you know floor whatever here's a blankie 
You don't really need him here. He's from, what, now he lives in Bellingham, Washington, so no blanket needed because they're so used to cold, cold, you know. But, th- but when they come, you, you if they come and they want to hang out with you, and you're with them all the time, day and night, you just do stuff. Hey, we're going to go do this. I've got to run to the store. Come with me. Let's go do that. We, you run errands together. You just hang out and just, anyone ever had a really good friend come to town and you literally just spend the whole time there that they're here visiting? You do everything together. I mean, you just like, come on, the, you get up, let's have a cup of coffee together. We, you, 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 whatever it is that you're going to do, you just, you just spend time together. But if, if during the course of their visit, you have to say to them, hey, excuse me, I'm going to go do something. I don't really think it's your cup of tea. See, I got this little pet sin, and um, I really don't want you to even know about it, but why don't you just stay here and watch TV? I'll go, I'm going to go over there. I'll be back in a while. Better yet, how about Jesus comes to visit? Would you take him everywhere? On every appointment, from the moment you wake up, would you be, would you be at the table having breakfast with him? Or would you be like, okay, Lord, we got to go do this now. Let's go. Or would you be doing something that you go, Lord, I'm sorry, but this, I'm, I'm sure this isn't your cup of tea. I, I got a little bit of, s- well, you just wait right here. I'll be back. If there's anything in your day that you think, I, I really wouldn't want to take Jesus along for that part of the day. It wouldn't really be suitable for the Lord. You just identified an area of sin in your life. Because if you can't do it with Jesus walking with you, you don't need to be doing it, period. If you're looking at pornography or you're, you're going to the bars or you're carousing and you're doing something that you know Jesus wouldn't join you on, then you just found out what you need to quit doing. Because Jesus said, I am with you until the ends of the what? Of the age. I'll never leave you, he says. I'll never what? Forsake you. But you can't just be forsaking him and going, Lord, I know I like you. And you know, I, saw, I met with you on Sunday, and that was good at church and all. But, you know, i got a busy week plan, and i am going to get a few uh, stops, and I'm sure it's not for you. That's not abiding. That's sinning. And you need to repent. Because that'll get you in trouble. That'll get you walking down the wrong path. And I want, I want you to be able to really produce fruit in the Lord. But the only way to produce fruit fr- that we're talking about, this, this fruits of the Spirit, this kindness, is that you have to stay connected to Jesus. You have to see how he would treat people. You know, when you bring him along into a circumstance and there's somebody there hurting, will, will the Lord let you know what he would want done? I mean, some people are like, how does God talk to you? I said, let me tell you, he doesn't need a megaphone. He doesn't need, a, there's no audible voice going, easy, do this. You know, no. I, inside, there's this thing I can't even describe. It's like, he just makes me look like, like an impression, like, wake up. See that? That person's hurting. I, w- yeah, okay, I see them hurting, Lord. What? What do you want me to do? He said, what would I do? Now, this is the conversation I'm trying to put into words, What he, the impression he puts on me. What would I do? I'm with you. What would I do? I'd be like, you go take care of him. Duh. <laughs> you know, sometimes Christianity is made way too complicated. When the Lord shows you what he would do, you just got to do it. When you walk in those things, what he would do, that kindness that he shows us and says, show that to them. That's all Abigail did. She just showed kindness to David's men, to David. Sweet victory in the end. She winds up married to him. Wife of the king. That's just, no, he's not the king yet. But she, did she know that he would be? That God had called him to be the next? Yeah. Sometimes these women are very perceptive, guys. They're paying attention. Listen up. They might be sent by God to save you from getting in trouble, from blowing your little hot head and getting in, you know, a big sticky mess. That's what Abigail did. She saved David that day. Now, back in Galatians 5.22, the next fruit after kindness was what? I mentioned it before. Goodness. 
And I asked the kids last week, because I thought I was going to get to that. <laughs> Silly me. I thought I was going to get patience, kindness, goodness, all done in one sermon. I'm too long-winded to do that. But I, I, I asked the kids, what would be a really good example of goodness? You know? And what, you know what the first thing they said? Just think. From the New Testament, by the way. They didn't use the... I, I have a lot of s- knowledge in the Old I love to... Oh, there's a lot of good stories I could do goodness from the Old Testament. But they came up with a New Testament one. One that Jesus told. That's right. The Good Samaritan. One, would, would you turn with me to Luke? I like to highlight each of these, um, these attributes of, uh, 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 of the Holy Ghost these fruits of the Spirit, as they're called in Galatians, in, in an example from the Scripture that, that helps really bring it to light. And this is probably, well, <coughs> I can't go wrong, because who's teaching? This is Luke chapter 10, by the way. Luke chapter 10, and I, I'll pick up um, in verse 25. Luke 10, 25. Thi- this is um, where a, an attorney, a lawyer, stands up there where Jesus is teaching and it says, and he stood up to put Jesus to a test. He's got a test for, for Jesus. He says to him, teacher, what, should, what should I, shall I do to inherit eternal life? Verse 26, Jesus then said to him, what's written in the law? How does it read to you? You know, it's interesting. Jesus doesn't just answer him straight with a straight answer. He asks him a question. By the way, are you allowed to ask a question? When someone asks you a question, you know, some Christians, are s- they get sucked into this terrible trap. Someone asks them a qu- question, trying to stump them, you know, put them to the test. And the Christians try to answer the test question like they have some compelling, I have to answer. They ask. No, you don't. Do you ever know that sometimes the person asking doesn't really care about the answer? They're just trying to make you look stupid. Are you allowed to ask a question in return? You should study Jesus if you want to know how to answer some jerks when they do this. And if you don't think that they will come around, just come stay by me for a while. I don't know why, but they think I'm like a jerk magnet. You know, they just, my wife's like, how do you find them all? I go, I don't find them. They come to me. And they want to put you to the test. Like, just like Jesus. So what's the law say? Uh, 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 what what shall, shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus, Jesus doesn't even tell him. He just says, what's th- you're a lawyer. What's written in the law? How's it read to you? So the man answered. Listen to this, verse 28. Or 27, I'm sorry. He said, he answered right here from Deuteronomy. He says, this is chapter 6 of Deuteronomy, verse, around verse 5. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And you shall love your neighbor as your what? As yourself. You guys know this, right? The golden rule. Love God, love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus, listen to this. Jesus answered him. He said, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Does Jesus make it really hard? No. But this is a lawyer he's talking to. And look what the lawyer says next. (laughs) But wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? (laughs) And this is where we get the story of the Good Samaritan. Right here, verse 30, and Jesus replied. (laughs) He said, there was a man that (coughs) that was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, if you know this, tra- to I- those b- you've been there, Jan, in Israel. My wife, Jan, I got two Jans in the front here, both been there. If you go over the top of the Mount of Olives, down the backside toward Jericho, there's a valley. And this is the desert region. And if you're familiar with deserts, do you walk out in the hot plains in the sun in the desert to travel? No. There's a, there is this deep ravine, valley, with a little, we call it a creek in Arizona. They call it actually a river. <laughs> it's a trickle, okay? But it's water, and water in the desert is life. So there's this, there's this valley, and it goes, it, it, it traverses all the way from the backside of the Mount of Olives. It goes all the way down to Jericho. Now, Jericho is the place, remember that Joshua fought the Battle of Jericho? He didn't really fight, the Lord fought, but... 
anyway, the Lord made the walls go down. Jericho was, in the early days of Israel, the um, wintering palace, uh, the capital for the, the kings of Israel. The Jerusalem was the summertime. It's a higher elevation. It's up in the mounts, the Mount of Zion, we call. It's cooler. So they have their summer times up there. Remember, this is not AC and heating and all that stuff like we got today. Th this, you, if you're the king, you can afford to have two places to, to rule from. Okay, so one is in, one one is here down in Jericho, in, 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 in what is a, a lower elevation down, kind of toward the Dead Sea, and it's um. In the winter time, it would be warmer, than staying in Jerusalem. It, people don't realize it, it snows. Have any of you seen a picture of Jerusalem covered in snow? You know, that golden thing is all covered up, all white. and It gets cold. Well, the valley between there was, is that, it's actually mentioned in the Bible. It's called the valley of the shadow of what? Death. Or another name, the valley of, uh, 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 of thieves. It's the last walk Jesus would take before he came into Jerusalem. He'll actually come through that valley of the shadow of death prophetically up over the Mount of Olives and he'll look across at Jerusalem and he'll weep. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How I wanted to gather you like a hen gathers its chicks, but you wouldn't have nothing to do with me. Jesus came to do that. But but Jesus said <coughs> to the man that's an attorney, he says, um, there was a certain man, he was traveling tor toward um, uh, 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 the, uh, the, well, on the road here and these guys knew this road. He was going from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he fell amongst the robbers, and they stripped him, and they beat him, and they went away, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, it says there was a priest going down on that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, there was a Levite who also, he came in to the place, and he saw him, and he passed by on the other side. A priest and a Levite, this is not good. These are the religious guys, right? You just see him tuck the robe in. Can't. Oh, that guy looks bad. Let's we'll go over here. But it says, but a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon the man, and when he saw him, he felt compassion. And he came up to him, and he bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. Then the next day he took out two denarii. That's two days' wages. A man's full day's earnings. Two, two full days of, of wages and he put it to the innkeeper and said take care of this man and whatever more you spend I will when I return I will pay you he says which of these three Jesus asked the attorney proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands now just so you know by the way a Samaritan in Jewish culture is not someone remember the, the woman from Samaria, Samaria the, at the well and she said, why do you talk to me? I'm a Samaritan. We don't have any dealings with you Jews. Because the Samaritans were, were their half-breeds, yeah. When the Assyrian army had invaded the northern part of Israel, this is like, I, I, my mind's saying around 520 B.C., but don't, I, I'll have to look that one up for positive for you. But there was a, they, they came in, they killed off the, the, some of the men of Israel, and, they, and as a humiliation, the warriors of the Syrians went into to the Israeli women. And the offspring, now were the Jews supposed to marry outside of their Jewish? But no. So now, it, double humiliation, they have the women impregnated by their enemy and the children born. Those children would grow up with Jewish moms and Syri enemy Syrian dads, and they would wind up becoming the people we call the Samaritans. Well, they're not exactly liked by the Jews. And Jesus, telling the story, picks the guy who is the guy that shows mercy and compassion on the, the man who fell into the hands of the thieves and took care of him and, and put up his money to take care of him and said, if it costs you any more, let me know and I'll repay you. A Samaritan did this. And Jesus says, so which one of them proved to be a neighbor? The priest, the Levite, or the good Samaritan? And the man answered, he said, um, 
Well, I suppose. <laughs> I no, no, did you see that? The one who showed mercy toward him. Man, you can just tell it's killing the guy. And Jesus answered. He said, go and do the same. Does Jesus want us to be merciful to people? Does he want us to do, when it comes to, to showing goodness, goodness is expressed by helping people when they're in trouble. That's what real goodness does. And kindness, well, we saw Abigail, she stepped in and kept someone from doing evil when they were intent on it. Did you know that's actually a kind thing to do? You know, you say you're a good friend to your, to your, to your buddy, but you see him doing evil and you don't do anything about it. What's it say in James? If you see your brother in sin, you who are spiritual are supposed to what? Go to him. First you look, Jesus said, make sure you get any um, beams out of your own eye before you try to take any specks out of your brother's eye. <laughs> you know, I know that's a speck of pine. I recognize the guy's got a log hanging out of his eye. Yeah, I'm sure it's pine. How do you know? I'm sure, man, I know. Jesus said, get the beam, that log out of your own eye first and then go help your brother. But when you go to him, you're, uh, true kindness is if you see your brother going in the wrong way, you go to him and you say, man, you're, that's not right. Now, will your brother always like you when you do this? Word of experience, not. Sometimes they hate your guts. Get used to it. Later, the interesting thing happens. Later, they go, you were the only one that told me I was doing wrong. I have the greatest respect for you. And they actually, when they, it, and by the way, will the Lord must work them over and get them to repent? You know, eventually they will. And when they do, they'll come to you and go, thanks for being the one that at least told me right. You know, Abigail, David's, David, the Bible says David, even though he messed up, says he was a man after God's own heart. He had a heart that was tender. When God corrected him, he received that correction. I hope I always want to be like that. I mean, I know I mess up. But I don't want to be the one that is stiff-necked and, and, and like the Jews that, that, that were, would, would resist when God was correcting. I want to be the one that goes, all right, Lord, you're right. I got to stop. Be like David and, you know, be, be able to call your sin sin and repent of it. That's the right thing. And if you have a true friend, a true friend will sometimes tell you you're blowing it. You need to stop. And they might get mad at you for a little while. It'll happen. You'll see. But in the long run, they'll know you really care about them. And that's what true goodness and kindness does. Now, next week, we've got a few more fruits of the Spirit to finish this up. So read ahead. See if you can guess what scriptures we're going to. I'm not telling. I, I, there's some really good ones for the next ones coming up, okay? That, that uh, this Galatians 5.22, longest study you'll ever hear on it, unless it's John Higgins. He can outdo me any day. But uh, that's the pastor who mentored me. I am short-winded, guys, compared to him. Some guys were telling me, do you really give a long message? I said, no, I grew up with a guy that could do hour and a half, two and a half hour messages. And, man, everyone was, like, hanging just on the – they'd get done after three hours. They'd be like, why are you stopping now? Man, we're really get, just getting into it. I, I, I remember those days. There's, there's something about that sweet thing that God's Spirit does when there's a hunger to hear about His Word. You know, in other countries right now, there's some revivals happening, and the people get together, and they don't want to go home. They, they tell, you know, I've been asked to come to, to Africa. This pastor keeps writing. I, I saw your thing on uh, Facebook, and you're on YouTube, and can you come preach to us? We will set up an all-day for, for, for a whole week, every day, we'll come and hear the word of God. Can you teach all day? And I was thinking, that's hunger. They want to know about the, uh, she, she said, Izzy can do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Lord tells me, my wife always wanted to go to Africa, but not for souls. She always liked the African animal, the giraffe, the elephant. My whole life, always, you know, we'd go to the zoo when we were young, courting, and, and the Phoenix Zoo. And she'd, she'd go there by the giraffes and stuff, say, we got to go to Africa. We went, when we were with my father-in-law this uh, just a couple weeks ago in Phoenix, 
and the cheetahs were actually out. I, you, you know how many times you go to the cheetah exhibit and you never see a cheetah? They blend right in the grass. You never see them. There was, there's three of them. It was really cold and it was really windy. And for some reason, the wind was whipping some smells that got them real excited. And I thought, finally, there's really cheetahs at the Phoenix Zoo, you know? Because I didn't believe them. They, they, they never show up. I said, honey, we don't have to go to Africa now. We've seen the cheetah right there, three of them. It was, uh, it was three, they call them what, brood or some brothers? They were all together, the, the, these three that hunt in a pack. But anyway, would you stand with me? Let's sing a closing song and, and send you in the joy and the peace of the Lord and, and ask the Lord to just let these words sink into our hearts. Lord, we pray right now that you would indeed cause what we've gone over, Lord, to speak to each person here. Let the words just minister to our hearts, Lord. Help us to be more kind. Help us to walk in the goodness that you desire us to walk in. As we go from this place this day, be with us, Lord. Fill us to overflowing with your compassion, your mercy, your grace. In Jesus' name we ask. And everyone that agreed with me said, Amen. Amen. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo, and God bless.